We did take a camera crew to Vietnam twice. We had to move our whole crew there. We had to figure out locations and gear and workflow. We all wanted to represent the Vietnamese perspective, but we weren't sure we'd be able to. If we didn't find a way to do it, our whole film was gonna not be what we wanted it to be. There are North Vietnamese soldiers and Viet Cong guerrillas and South Vietnamese civilians, and you go in always realizing that the first thing you have to do is shed what you thought you knew. Tôi đã chứng kiến là phía bên Mỹ người ta mất. Mặc dầu ngôn ngữ tôi không biết, nhưng mà họ vẫn khóc, họ vẫn điều diều với nhau. Khi họ bị bị thương á, họ cũng kè với nhau, rồi họ cũng khiên sát với nhau mà họ khóc rất nức nở. Rồi tôi đã chứng kiến cái đó thì tôi nghĩ rằng người Mỹ cũng như người Việt của chúng tôi thôi cũng 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 có cái tình thương bao la như thế nhưng mà họ vẫn đùm bọc với nhau. We wanted to get to know the people, we wanted to get to know the place, we wanted to spend time there, we wanted to make people feel comfortable with us so that we could do what we do. We had a wonderful Vietnamese producer, Ho Dang Hoa, and he was the one really who helped us identify veterans and find people to talk to. Công việc của tôi là giúp họ, giúp những người làm phim phát hiện ra được những cái câu chuyện hay, những nhân chứng sống có những câu chuyện hay và tìm các cái tư liệu trong cái kho lưu trữ hay trong cái còn còn lại ở Việt Nam. For us to do interviews the way we like to do them, in a foreign language, it was a challenge to come up with a way that we could feel like we were having a natural conversation. Mark Roy, our extraordinary sound man, came up with a system where we basically had two interpreters everywhere we went. Our Vietnamese producer would hear our question and then reinterpret that question for our Vietnamese interviewee. And then Ben Wilkinson, our extraordinary consulting producer, would be off in a closet or a bathroom or down a dingy hallway. He was listening on an earpiece, whispering into a microphone, and we could hear him. So we're basically having, like they have at the UN, simultaneous translation of the interview. So we could be responding in real time to what the people were saying. By the time the second question was asked, they realized we were just having a conversation. And even though we couldn't actually understand each other, we really understood each other. What struck me was how beautiful Vietnam was to look at. There were just these endless acres of these jade green rice paddies and these lovely villages inside these groves of bamboo and palm trees. So how can a place like this, so beautiful and so enchanting, be at war? We are now climbed up a little hill in Lang Co, shooting some incredible rice paddies. We don't quite know what's going to happen. We have to be open-minded. We're driving down the road. Oh my god, the sun is setting. There's a rice paddy. Jump out, cross the road, get the camera, quick, quick, quick. You know, that, that happens all the time. Our cinematographer, Buddy Squires, just completely outdid himself to get the footage that we thought we might use. Now, many people in Vietnam are too young to remember the war, but they still have family members who know someone. I mean, it's just, it's that close. And you just sort of try to understand, if you possibly can, what this experience meant for them. It's inspiring to see how resilient people can be because you walk around Vietnam, there is no sign that a war happened there. It's not as though there's this dark cloud hanging over every part of Vietnam. It's not like that at all. But you have to look hard to find evidence of the war.